Welcome to Bug Banter with the Xerxes Society, where we explore the world of invertebrates and discover how to help these extraordinary animals. If you want to support our work, go to xerces.org slash donate. Hi, I'm Rachel in Missoula, Montana. And I'm Matthew in Portland, Oregon. Last month, we met with Isis Howard to talk about Western monarch populations and community science. Today, we are going to talk about monarchs east of the Rockies, from their overwintering sites to their multi-generational migration and the stops along the way, we will take a deeper look at the journey of the monarch. To lead us in this discussion is Dr. Ray Morans, who is the Xerxes Grazing Lands Pollinator Ecologist, also a partner biologist for the Nat Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Central National Technology Support Center. One focus of his is to assist in the planning and implementation of monarch butterfly conservation efforts in the South Central U.S. Ray has also studied the effects of fire and grazing on prairie plants and butterfly communities. Ray, we're so excited to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. My great pleasure to be here. Uh, guys, it's a super fun topic and I look forward to uh, chatting about monarchs. I mean, let, let's start with the adults, Ray. Um, where do monarchs east of the Rockies spend the winter? Well, the overwhelming majority of monarchs east of the Rocky Mountains in that are east of the Rocky Mountains in August, September, start heading south to central Mexico, uh, specifically to the state of Michoacan, just west of Mexico City. And I've had the great fortune to be able to go there once, and it was spectacular. And I got to see many, many uh, tens of millions of monarchs, because uh, I went to the single best site for monarchs in the world, and um, it was amazing. Wow. So those areas that monarchs go to, even in California, aren't actually that warm. And my question is, why don't they go further south where there's warmer temperatures? That, that's a great that's a great question. It seems that maybe a few do go, a tiny handful go to some warmer places. But overall, they're seeking out places on the California coast and our eastern monarchs seeking places high up in the mountains of Mexico that are very consistently cool. They don't, if they're, if it's too warm for them, basically they'll die of old, of old age. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll be, they'll be too active. Their physiology will be uh, running too high. Um, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll die quickly. They are trying to survive the whole winter in a base, in basically a steady state. And by keeping cool, um, that keeps them that way. On the other hand, if they want some, uh, if they stayed up north in Minnesota where it's super cold, uh, it, it would just, they would die. Uh, so they've, they've got to get somewhere warmer, uh, but ideally somewhere cool. Um, if it gets hot, that helps turn on their reproductive hormones. And when the reproductive hormones turn on, that causes them to, to deteriorate more quickly. Sounds like the, the Goldilocks zone between not being too cold where they'll die and not being too warm and they'll live too quickly. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And so, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the mountains <clears throat> in Mexico, do all the, sorry, do all the monarchs east of the Rockies end up migrating down there? The overwhelming majority do. Um, the uh, 99%, maybe, maybe a lot higher than 99% uh, head down to Michoacan, Mexico. But it has been known for years, people who live uh, on the Gulf Coast, Houston, New Orleans, uh, some places on the Florida coast, they'll find some monarchs um, in, in the middle of winter. Miami, for sure, uh, it's, it's easy to find. I've seen monarchs in Miami, Florida in the middle of winter. Um, that's been known for a long time. A fascinating study got published just this year um, by folks from South Carolina, uh, including I think Michael Kendrick is the first author and Billy McCord, who was the fellow who did the field work for decades. And he showed that monarchs, some monarchs, again, a tiny handful compared to the ones that go to Mexico, a tiny handful go to the South Carolina coast each winter and mm -hmm. spend the winter on the beach. Yeah. And, and Billy maintains that 
and you know Billy's lived in that area his whole life. He says the temperature there is pretty similar to Michoacan in winter. Mm -hmm. It's not very hot. It doesn't get deep freezes. So uh, he, 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 you know, that could be a, a, a terrific point. Finally, uh, I have a dear old friend, uh, Dr. Christina Docks, uh, originally from the nation of Colombia, who discovered uh, about 20 years ago that monarchs, my, some monarchs migrate to Cuba and spend the winter in Cuba. She actually paid the price for doing that research. She was put in jail by Cuban uh, authorities multiple times. Hmm. Uh, wow. They thought she was an American spy. <laughs> um, why, why else would somebody be walking around with a butterfly net? But uh, fascinating research. And now there's some latest mm -hmm. findings from Christina and her colleagues in Latin America. Some monarchs are going seemingly uh, to uh, Cozumel and then on to Guatemala. Again, tiny numbers, we think, compared to Misha Makan, but it's something we need to look at more closely. Wow. It's amazing. As you say at the beginning, there's so much we we know and a lot we don't you know so it's, Absolutely. it's great that there's people actually helping to figure out these these answers yeah that's so interesting you wonder why some go to mexico and some go to other spots which we're gonna get into a little bit later in terms of their behavior and trying to figure out why they go where they do and when they choose to go um but talking about these overwintering adult monarchs how long do these particular individuals live do these live, you know, they're overwintering for months. Do they live longer than other monarchs further down in the in the migration chain? Absolutely. The, the, let's, let's start with a summer monarch in comparison. Uh, summertime monarch that you would find in, in uh, New York State or Minnesota in July lives, if it's lucky, lives for about four weeks. Uh, of course, it could get eaten by a bird or, or get hit by a car or something sad like that. Um, they die of old age after a few weeks. That's the Those are the monarchs during the breeding season. Remember earlier I said those reproductive hormones help to cause the butterfly to, to die of old age, basically. But this generation that goes down to Mexico and spends the whole winter in Mexico can live for as long as eight, maybe even nine months. So that would make it them among the most long-lived butterflies in the world. Most butterflies live for only a few weeks. It's uh, mm -hmm. that their their uh, their beauty is ephemeral. But those over those monarchs that go to Mexico for the winter live for a very long time. So think of a monarch that comes out of its chrysalis in Minneapolis in early August. Uh, it migrates down to Mexico. It might get there around November first, November second. Uh, spends the whole winter there and then starts migrating up in the spring. Um, it might live all the way until April or May, August 1st until early May. Can I do the math? Uh, gosh, a little over eight months. So very, very um, amazing creatures to be able to live that long. Yeah. And some of that is hormone you know, management within the body. And some of it is just finding the right overwintering spot. Right. Absolutely. And those overwintering yeah. spots, you know, there are predators down there. So they have some of them do get eaten, but the ones that don't get eaten, um, <clears throat> you know, they're they during the very cool, cool periods, they're they're quite inactive um, on warm days. They do. A lot of them do fly, but they're yeah. they're You know, they don't have a lot to do down there. Just hunker down on the cool days and, and um, take it easy and survive the winter. Yeah. Cool. And so the, the monarchs overwintering in, in Mexico, in the mountains, um, when they're ready to migrate, how far do they travel before they start breeding and reproducing again? That, um, that's been pretty well studied, at least on the American side of the Rio Grande. Uh, as they head up from central Mexico, uh, they, 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 we usually think of them leaving central Mexico primarily in early March to mid-March. Um, I don't think there are many milkweeds right near the overwintering colonies, which are high elevation, but as they come down to lower elevations in Mexico, they'll find some milkweeds and they'll, they'll lay some eggs on milkweeds in Mexico pretty soon after they depart. But I believe that the great majority of them lay most of their eggs in Texas, 
and then secondarily in Oklahoma. Now some scoot along the Gulf Coast and make it to Louisiana and maybe Mississippi and a few into Arkansas. And a tiny handful in a normal year make it to southern Kansas. Uh, laying eggs, one here, one there, as they go north, um, and uh, those females, of course, laying the eggs, and uh, uh, trying to spread out their eggs as best they can. So uh, Texas is the most important state for Eastern monarchs, both in the springtime uh, for laying the eggs of that, um, that become the first generation, and then in the fall uh, as they migrate to Mexico. Wow, that's very cool. And I'm a little jealous because you're in Oklahoma. So you probably get to experience some of these overwintering adults. Absolutely. And and it was this spring, uh, each I see them every spring, <clears throat> not huge numbers, but I see some and they lay eggs on the milkweeds that I've planted for them, which is awesome. I search the milkweeds almost every day. And this year I was finding some in May that were fantastically worn out. That mm. told me when they're heavily, heavily worn out and their color has faded so that they're a very, almost a pale brown instead of a bright orange, that's when you know that you've got a very old butterfly. This is a butterfly, almost certainly, that spent the winter in Mexico, flew back uh, and is, has lived about eight months. Uh, as opposed to a new generation of, of monarchs, which will look so um, so resplendent, so colorful. Wow, what a journey for a tiny insect to fly that far. I just can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah. So you've talked about monarchs laying eggs. They An adult monarch can lay up to 400 eggs. Mm -hmm. Out of those 400, how many of those actually make it to adulthood? Fantastic research out of the lab of Dr. Karen Oberhauser, who I think was at the University of Minnesota at the time. Uh, their research showed that about 1% of the eggs, so four out of the 400 eggs laid by a, by a, a female, if she was able to lay all 400, only about four of those would, would become adults. So it's a very dangerous world out there for, for monarchs, just as it is for for uh, most invertebrates. There are plenty of predators, uh, parasites, parasitoids for them to worry about. It's tough, it's sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's a, yeah, four out of 400, that's, yeah, yep. that's, a, that's a high loss. Um, and I know that, I mean, part of that, and obviously, you know, the, the bigger backstory to this is that monarchs are, declining there's not as many monarchs as there used to be i mean you mentioned that you you know went down and you saw tens of millions of them but, but there used to be hundreds of millions right. you know, may, maybe a billion in in yep. the eastern states um yeah. and so i mean i i totally get when when we've, we've got this much decline that that it's like it makes sense that people would want to bring the eggs inside you know breed them um try and increase the number of adults that come that make it through um is, is is that a i mean this kind of backyard kitchen countertop rearing whatever you want to call it is that a viable way to help monarch populations do you think i mean does it if you're boosting the number from you know four out of 400 to 40 or 200 does does that really help is it a good thing we don't encourage that at, at, at xerces uh, for, for multiple reasons. Um, yeah, we don't think it is a viable strategy. We, we, we hope people focus more on producing habitat. Now, with that said, we know that rearing monarchs is fun. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have done it, you know, a number of times uh, uh, over my life. And I certainly, certainly did it when I had little kids in the house and taught them about it. Sure. Uh, it's fun. It's educational. So, um, you know, raising a five, four or five monarchs, caterpillars uh, to adulthood can be a wonderful experience, but we do have concerns about raising mass numbers, 10, more than 10. Uh, the biggest concern that I have is disease, that if you raise them uh, together in, in, in a container, you greatly increase the likelihood of 
these organisms spreading a disease or maybe even a new disease agent, um, uh, a new pathogen evolving, similar to, you know, all of a sudden COVID, um, you know, COVID showed up a few years ago. Um, so, so that's a big concern. Another concern is raise a whole lot of monarchs. Uh, you release them all in one place. Will there be enough resources out in your neighborhood to support them? Now, hopefully they'll get, if, if they're not, hopefully they'll get a move on and, and, and search for more. Um, but uh, there is a concern about that. And then also some studies, multiple studies have shown problems with monarchs uh, with their ability to migrate after they've been reared. So certainly if you rear them, please don't do it, you know, in, in, inside, don't do it in a dark room. Um, ideally, if you rear any monarchs, and again, we're encouraging a small number uh, at the most, try to do it in some cage outdoors where they're getting conditions as natural as can be, natural lighting, natural temperatures, et cetera, et cetera, so that they'll be um, more attuned to the, to the, um, the natural cues that, that uh, tell them when to migrate. Thank you, Ray. I think that's a question we get a lot. And I'm glad that you brought up the habitat issue. And I think when people do it and they see that all of those caterpillars they brought inside become adults, it's hard to not feel like, oh, but I saved all these monarch adults. But unless you're following them down to Mexico, <laughs> it's hard to know whether actually they're able to navigate. And there's so much we still don't know about them. Um, yeah, I think habitat is so important. And I know we're we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but Picking up where we left off, um, in March and early April, these overwintering adults have migrated to Texas and Oklahoma, raised backyard, and mm -hmm. laid lots and lots of eggs. How long does it take for those eggs to become adults? Uh, on average, uh, uh, an egg, it takes about 30, 30 days on average. Now, if you are if you have a lot of cold weather, it'll take longer than 30. If you have a lot of warm weather, in the middle, you know, middle of summer, maybe... 24, 24 days. So, but basically think about a, a, a month that a new generation could be produced every month. So it's very fast, very fast life cycle. Um, and uh, um, that's what enables monarchs to have multiple generations per year. So the, this, that, that first generation, the one, as, as Rachel said, the one that bred in your backyard in <laughs> Oklahoma, um, how, how far north do they go? I mean, assuming from Oklahoma, they just keep going north rather than east towards the coast or anything. Um, well, it's, it's, I just, I mean, just kind of get a picture of like, cause we, I know we started the conversation just talking about overwintering, but they're everywhere across the continent. Really. I was, I was part of the lab, um, the Lincoln Brower lab at the university of Florida in the early nineties, wow. he published awesome. a paper saying that monarchs, uh, moved up north via successive generations. And I think at the time, um, I think in Dr. Brower's papers in the early 90s, it implies that it took two or three generations or maybe four to get all the way north. More recent information, uh, and this is really um, really touted by, by uh, Dr. Chip Taylor from the University of Kansas, is that Yes, the monarchs come up from Mexico, the overwintering ones lay eggs. They're, those eggs become the first generation of monarchs born in the US. And then those first generation monarchs go as far north. Some of them go as far north as monarchs will go during the entire year, uh, uh, that very first generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let's say a first generation, a, a, a female lays an egg, at my home, April 1st, she'll have adult offspring a month later on May 1st. They'll fly north. Some of them will lay eggs. Well, they'll be laying eggs. The females will be laying eggs all the way. Some of them will maybe stop in Kansas or stop in Iowa, but some will keep going all the way to Canada hmm. uh, wow. and, and uh, Manitoba and even Ontario and places in between. That's what Chip uh, Taylor maintains, if, if if I'm correct, and and looking at the the citizen the community science data online, you see that you see monarchs showing up, uh, first generation monarchs showing up way up north. So mm -hmm. after that, 
after that first generation, the following generations, generation two, generation three, are more staying put a little bit and multiplying, you know, breeding, breeding in their areas. Some of them may be, go a little bit east, a little bit west. I think the northeast, I don't think the northeast is very well colonized until later in the summer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, maybe, maybe that's the case where it takes second and third generations to make it to, to uh, mm -hmm. Long Island and Cape Cod. Sure had a lot of folks in Long Island and Connecticut this year emailing me and saying, hey, where are the monarchs? But uh, but in general, it's that first generation that really makes the big push up north. They lay eggs and die. I want to make it clear that that first generation, they don't go back to Mexico. It's it's a ways down yeah. the road that, that mm -hmm. monarchs head back to Mexico. It's a, I mean, just a, how how long does it take to get from that first generation to reach Manitoba? I mean, because it takes, they, they don't live for that long. So they must be flying pretty quickly. They're, they're moving. They're moving uh, um, a few weeks. Yeah. A few weeks. Wow. They are pushed. Uh, at that time of year, we tend to have a lot of south winds. Mm -hmm. And uh, th those south winds will push them north um, pretty far. And uh, that helps them. But uh, um, yeah. They, they move quite a long distance wow. in in uh, three, four, maybe five weeks. Yeah. Wow. That's that's impressive. That is impressive. So, Ray, you mentioned um, first generation. We've talked about quite a bit. And then you said second and third. How many generations are produced east of the Rockies, um, which we're talking about? And which of those generations then flies back, you know, following up and completing our, our journey here? Um, which generation flies south to Mexico in the fall and kind of completes that that journey? Great question. Uh, in general, we, we view Eastern monarchs as having four generations. Again, that first generation being born in uh, Oklahoma and Texas in, in around May 1st. It's the fourth generation that then flies down to Mexico, um, starting in maybe... Um, maybe early to mid-August, fourth generation monarchs that are up in Manitoba, in Minnesota, North Dakota, Ontario, Maine, Massachusetts, they start getting the urge to, to, to fly south. I do want to say that there are cases of um, monarchs, of there being fifth and, and possibly even sixth generations of monarchs, and that, that happens more down south, where we have more time before the cold weather comes, so we can mm -hmm. fit a more couple more generations in. and that just got discovered um, fairly recently by Professor Kristen Baum, formerly of Oklahoma State University, uh, now at the University of Kansas. Wow. So that last generation that becomes the overwintering adults that we started with are very hardy. It's really impressive that such a small insect can fly so far and survive for so long. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and think of all the work that it took to discover where they're going. I mean, I'm trying to think 60, 70 years ago, people really didn't know where they were going. Maybe they were all going to Cuba. Maybe, maybe they're spending the winter in Louisiana, um, mm. Florida. And now, you know, of course, in the 70s, uh, it was discovered um, by a Canadian scientist um, that, yes, the overwhelming majority fly down to Mexico. Um, mm. Pretty, pretty amazing. So now that we understand this sort of multi-generation migration and where they go and their timing, something I think about often is how do the monarchs know where to go? That's one question. And then my, my second question, is there any sense or research that shows how they know with timing? Uh, absolutely. Fantastic questions, both. Uh, as far as the timing goes, uh, decreasing day length seems to have a really... Mm -hmm be a really, really important cue to trigger them to start departing the northern states. Um, uh, and again, early to mid-August, days are getting shorter. And I don't know how they sense it, but monarchs can sense that. Uh, and that triggers those fourth generation monarchs to, to, um, to go into reproductive diapause, actually, to, to, to basically turn their reproductive hormones off and start flying down south. Uh, how do they navigate? Still not perfectly understood. Um, there's some thought that they use magnetic fields 
uh, that's probably a very big factor. Again, uh, pretty amazing to think of uh, this butterfly with very tiny brain being able to use magnetic fields to help it navigate. Uh, I, I learned almost only very recently that uh, the great majority of them fly, uh, enter Mexico through the same pass, uh, through the same mountain pass. And so that amazes me. And I don't understand that, that they're, that, but somehow they're guided to that same mountain pass because the, the, the border, the Texas Mexico border is very long. And yeah. yet the great majority are, are headed, I think it's called Eagle Pass. And they're headed for that. Um, maybe once they get through that pass that 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 has them on the proper side of the ridges, and if they as long as they follow those ridges, mountain ridges down through Mexico, they'll they'll make it to Michoacan. Um, I don't fully understand that part. I yeah, think. I was going to say because, but oh. I mean, we really have no sense of of how a monarch would know it's that mountain pass, right? That's you right. know, you, That's you've, right. you've come from two thousand miles away and you've flown across everything, and then it's like, oh, I better turn right a little bit here. I've got to get right. the right path. And yeah, they've never just... done it before. Oh, it was their great, mm -hmm. great, yeah. great, great grandmother and or great 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 grandfather that that last flew that journey so it is yeah. miraculous that they're able to do this it's just it's just mind-blowing really isn't it yep yeah i was gonna say it would make sense you know with um some seabirds and sea turtles and like salmon they go back you know to the same place that they were born and that's where they lay their eggs and um it's crazy to think that yeah these monarchs have never been down in mexico and yet somehow <laughs> they know how to get there. I mean, it's just really, really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> My mind is blown. Yeah, but I say so even with like some of the sea creatures though, it's like, how do they know where to find that river they came from? You know, <laughs> when you've been out there in the ocean. Anyway, that's a completely different conversation. Um <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, that's the like the the movement, the migration. Um along the way, the monarchs need to support themselves, right? I know that milkweeds are really associated with monarchs for a good reason because it's the plant that the caterpillars eat um why is it that the caterpillars feed on such a limited range of plants oh uh, excellent question um monarchs have evolved so that their caterpillars specialize on milkweeds milkweeds and there are many many species of them by the way which is good for marks um milkweeds tend to be poisonous. Uh, I actually studied milkweed chemistry for my master's degree and, and found that some of the milkweeds of Northern Florida had no poisons whatsoever. And hmm. Others were very low in poison, uh, whereas some other species I discovered were the most toxic milkweeds east of the Rocky Mountains. So um, the, the, the key reason why I'm mentioning these poisons is most insects cannot eat these toxic milkweeds. Monarchs evolve the ability to do so. They specialize, and that for that creates this this uh, source of food that is somewhat unique. Uh, now there uh, there are others there are some other insect species that have evolved just like monarchs have to be able to use uh, toxic milkweeds as caterpillars. But uh, that's um, that's why they need milkweeds. They they've they've they they've headed in that direction, and they're sticking to it. Uh, and I find it amazing that they can even find them. And I've watched many females find milkweeds out in the field. And sometimes the milkweed plants are an inch tall in a prairie uh, full of grasses that are four feet tall. And the monarch female is still able to find these tiny, tiny little milkweed plants. Um, I think they use a little bit of visual cues, but primarily they use their sense of smell hmm. to find them. I'm just, yeah, no, it is. I, I'm still processing caterpillars. Like, why would you select to eat the most toxic? I mean, there must be some benefit, surely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In 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 addition to having this resource that you can use and most other insects can't, the caterpillars sequester the cardiac glycosides within their tissues. Cardiac glycosides are the, the specific class of chemicals. Toxic chemicals in the milkweeds. The caterpillars mm -hmm. sequester them in the tissues. They help defend the caterpillar. The caterpillar 
caterpillar metamorphoses into a pupa or chrysalis, it still has those poisons. And then the adult monarch that results still has those toxins. And uh, it was Dr. Brower, the, the, the gentleman I mentioned earlier uh, at the University of Florida years ago, who discovered that uh, birds don't like to eat toxic monarchs. And I got the, to see the, the famous barfing blue jay. Yeah, I got to see barfing blue jays. It was really cool. <laughs> I think that has to be one, one, one of the classic journal covers of all time. You know? Absolutely. That one's from the 60s. I wasn't there for yeah. that photo, but I saw later iterations of the same experiment. Yeah. <laughs> So that's amazing yeah so basically the the caterpillars take the take the toxins and they taste bad you know oh, which yeah. makes yeah yeah, makes yeah actually the uh i've never tasted a monarch or a milkweed <laughs> but uh, i've been told um and research has indicated that cardiac glycosides taste very 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 bitter and mm -hmm. and the monarchs that have lots of these toxins taste dreadful to, yeah. to vertebrates such as birds or to humans. So Ray, a lot of people talk about milkweed, which is good, right? We need milkweed. We don't have enough on the landscape. We need people to plant it. That's probably the number one thing you can do to help monarchs, right? And not use pesticides. Um, but you have to think about the whole life cycle. So adult females need to lay their eggs on milkweed, but what are the adults eating from? Like, are we missing some plants here other than just milkweed? <laughs> So yeah, adult butterflies, uh, not all adult, you know, uh, some adult butterflies eat weird things like rotting fruit or bird droppings, but monarchs eat nectar and they need nectar to keep going. So we need more nectar plants out there, preferably native wildflowers or native trees and shrubs producing high quality nectar for monarchs and for our other pollinators. Uh, in my part of the world, uh, this, the, the South Central U.S., Oklahoma, Texas, it, uh, some people believe that our, our milkweed abundance is quite high down here, and it's the lack of nectar plants that's the bigger problem. It, I still plant milkweeds anyway, because I want, I want to, you know, enhance the environment for monarchs as much as I can. Mm -hmm. but, but the big emphasis in my region is nectar plants, and everywhere could use some more nectar plants to keep monarchs going during the summer, but it's especially important for that fourth generation of monarchs that's going to migrate south to Mexico. They need a lot of energy to enable them to fly south because it is a big journey. Now, much of that journey, they are soaring and gliding. They're using, uh, they're using the wind to carry them down, but, but uh, it is energetically taxing and they need na native nectar plants. And I'm uh, um, you know, happy to say that Xerxes has produced nectar plant lists, monarch nectar plant lists for every region of the lower 48 states. Those are available at our website. And I coordinate the Xerces Society's database of monarch nectar observations. So if um, maybe we can put a link, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm. that would be terrific. If we could put a link to our database because we need more data. We need more people to let us know what flowers monarchs are visiting where they live, particularly out in, out in, um, away from the garden and, and out in native ecosystems like woodlands and swamps and prairies and marshes. But we welcome data from anywhere and not just the US, Canada, Mexico, Cuba. Uh, we, 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 there's a lot more we need to know about nectar plants. Is, is there any particular season where it's, it might be more important? for the nectar plants to be available? Certainly fall is really important, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to, to build up their strength. What I find amazing, looking at the data in the database, we have very few records of monarchs nectaring in the spring. I think it's hmm. in part because the, the, that's the time of year when monarch numbers are the lowest, uh, because a lot of the monarchs died the previous year died on their way to Mexico or died in Mexico of, for various reasons or died on the way back up. So that's when the monarch population is smallest. Um, and we don't have a lot of data from the spring. So we <laughs> would very much welcome uh, data from any time of year. But uh, we, we really could use data from the spring and the fall. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Because yeah, the nectar is fueling them, right? They. Oh, yeah. Yep. What they they got to fly three two thousand three thousand miles. I mean, it's huge distance in the fall. 
and then have enough energy when they're old to to breed in the spring. Um, and I, I know you, you you touched on this a little bit earlier um, when you were saying that like the milkweed could be just an inch tall, and yet somehow the monarch can find it in amongst the the taller grasses. I mean, how how do they? I mean, you, you mentioned scent, but I don't know with butterflies where do they smell? You know, it's like <laughs> most they, insects don't have body parts like us, so it's like how do they hear or smell? It's like totally whacked out. They they use their antennae and they use they actually have chemosensory structures on their front legs and uh, okay. even to some degree on on their on their uh, on the feet uh, of their middle legs and and so uh, I imagine they're using their antennae uh, the sensory structures in their antennae uh, at a distance and then once they la land on a plant that they think might be a milkweed mm -hmm. uh, they can they can touch the antennae to it and touch their 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 four legs. Their, their front feet to it, yeah. uh, scratch at the leaf a little bit to get the chemicals um, wild up and sense those chemicals and say, hey, wow, this is a milkweed. I'll go yeah. ahead and lay eggs here. Scratch and sniff with a new, That's a right. new image there, isn't <laughs> scratch it? And so, sniff, scratch and sniff. But, but again, I'm thinking like one inch high milkweed, four foot high grass. Do the, the monarchs, they must climb down the grasses and then kind of walk around on stuff. It's just uh, um, amazing. They, they get any way they can. They they get there, and uh, in early spring, what's pretty amazing is that's that's the time of year when it's easiest to find milkweeds one inch tall. Uh, for sure. where I live in, in in late March, early February, uh, and maybe a, not a lot. Most haven't come up yet, but the monarchs are here, and they need to lay eggs. Those females feel compelled to lay eggs. So mm -hmm. I have found one inch tall milkweed plants with thirty eggs on it. Which is not a good development. <laughs> there won't be enough milkweed to to support all of those caterpillars. But um, hmm. um, that happens. It's called egg dumping, where the females just need to get out, just need, just feel compelled to lay eggs. Yeah. yeah. Um, but and miraculous how they can find them. And, and many other butterflies have similar um, amazing abilities. That's what. Well, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Ray. We have one more question left. It's my favorite one to ask as viewers or as listeners know. Um, so Ray and I are actually family. He is my cousin's husband and I've known Ray for almost my whole life. And you've been known as the butterfly guy in my family. Even before I met you, I just heard about this, this butterfly guy. He knows everything about butterflies. He loves butterflies. Um, and at Xerxes, you're one of a few butterfly experts that we have on staff and so my question to you is what inspired you to become the butterfly guy? What inspired you to go <laughs> into this line of work and to become an expert in the field? Great question. Uh, really two things. Uh, the first thing I'll say is I was, a, I was a graduate student trying to study birds um, at the University of Florida because uh, I was a lifelong bird watcher as, as a kid. And I was out in the woods and I saw a pipe vine swallowtail searching for pipe vines to lay on. And the pipe vines were about an inch tall and I couldn't find them, but she could. And this was in a forest. So I, I was amazed by the ability of female butterflies to sense their host plant. So uh, a big part of it, I've always loved animals. I've always loved plants, butterflies. Studying butterflies and the plants they depend on is a perfect way to combine those interests. Secondly, Having to be, happening to be at the University of Florida at the time when Dr. Lincoln Brower was there and hearing him talk about monarchs and the monarchs going to Mexico and and talking about his studies of the the barfing blue jays, uh, <laughs> uh, it was just a, a natural for me to to move into uh, his laboratory and start start working with him and uh, I'm very glad I did. Yeah, no, he's he's legendary. So that yeah. Yeah, what a great <laughs> opportunity. So. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Ray. This has been so enjoyable. I have learned yeah. a lot. I hope our listeners have as well. Um, thanks for being on. I hope we can have you um, back again soon. And we hope to have our listeners back as well. Thank you for your time today. My great pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Bug Banter is brought to you by the Xerces Society, a donor-based nonprofit that is working to protect insects and other invertebrates, the life that sustains us. If you are already a donor, thank you so much. 
If you want to support our work, go to Xerces.org slash donate. For information about this podcast and for show notes, go to Xerces.org slash bug banter.